Hello, everyone, and welcome to the University of Iowa Ceramics Virtual Visiting Artist Interview Series. My name is Andrew Casto, Program Head of Ceramics at the University of Iowa, and my guest today is Lindsay Pekaski, who is with us from St. Louis. Uh, she's a practicing visual artist there and uh, has a BFA from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, her MFA from the University of Colorado, Boulder, and was the 2011 a uh, taunt fellow at the Archie Bray Foundation in Helena, Montana. Since then, she's had a wealth of exciting exhibitions to her credit. And uh, Lindsay, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Um, we're excited to hear about your work. And I was wondering if we could start with you telling us just a little bit about how you got involved in ceramics. Sure. Um, well, as Andy said, I did my undergrad at Chapel Hill and um, that's a very uh, functional ceramic heavy program, or it was when I was there. And also um, it was a little bit hands off. So I actually, I um, wasn't really studying ceramics for the first few years there. Um, I was really interested in biology and I was still trying to do something in biology and art simultaneously and um, hadn't really even touched clay until I had the chance to go to Italy in Florence and study abroad for a semester. Wow. And while I was there, I took a figure sculpting class and the experience of um, just like we were in this tiny, really intimate room. It was very, you know, everything was very classical and being like a few feet away from a model on a rotating stand and touching this material, which just felt like working with the muscle or working with the body part and was so visceral. Um, I just kind of fell in love with that way of working and particularly with that way of articulating form. I had always loved drawing, um, as a kid and growing up and even in the beginning of undergrad but felt like it wasn't really clicking like i was still taking art classes and then the second i had my hands on clay it was like it clicked like i was able to actually get all this emotion and flush out all this detail yeah. and almost like collaborate with this material that really i felt like had a mind of its own um through working with the figure and also while i was there i um kind of had, we had the opportunity to explore all these, uh, you know, like the Duomo, we would go sit on the steps of the Duomo and sculpt the heads too, which was just like having that connection to history was also so cool. And um, it was a very non-ceramic-y approach to working with the material because we would just bisque fire and then we would do all kinds of cold surface treatments like graphite, yeah. wax, things like that. So it was all about you know, articulating the figure. It wasn't focusing on glazing or ceramic -y kinds of surfaces. Had you done clay at all before that trip? No, I mean, my mom has a few little like pinched dinosaurs that I made when I was little. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, in high school, I took art classes, but we didn't even have clay. We just, it was just painting and drawing. Huh. Yeah, yeah. That's fascinating. Um, I liked what you were saying about the cold surfaces and how that was an interesting, mm -hmm. Uh, way to get into it. Um, how did that influence what you would come to make later on? So when I got back and I was like, would go into the glaze lab and just, I was sort of baffled because I think I, I like missed the intro class because I was taking my intro equivalent with this figure sculpting class. And I was just like putting oxides together. I didn't know what I was doing. And then the result came out of the kiln. I was like, that's really not what I was going for. And so I just stuck with the cold surfaces. And that is sort of the language that I knew and it provided um, an intimacy and an immediacy for me that I really loved and felt uh, connected with the form of the work, like rubbing, the act of like rubbing pigment into a surface yeah. is so different from for me than dipping it or spraying glaze on or even painting glaze on. Um, yeah. But it's also simultaneously like you get instant gratification, if that yeah. makes sense, right? It, totally it doesn't did. have to go through the alchemy of the kiln. Yeah, it's yeah. such an exciting uh, way to come about the material too. I mean, to be able to study in a historical environment like that uh, is very different from what I experienced. And I think most of us uh, in an academic setting in this country get to mm -hmm. um, see and touch as ceramic artists is, is 
uh, radically different than that. So. Um, yeah, well, and I, f I feel, you know, in some ways I'm like, I wish I had discovered ceramics earlier, but I think if I had my, you know, I wouldn't have, I, I probably wouldn't be making the work I'm making. Like it was that experience because I was so interested in anatomy and biology, like thought I wanted to be a doctor <laughs> or a zoologist or something, you know? And so I think if I hadn't um, had that experience of working with the figure, I probably wouldn't have really clicked in the same way. Was it hard to make that choice to go the art route rather than the science? No, it wasn't. It wasn't. It's like I was taking all art classes in Italy and Chapel Hill is a very, um, I mean, they had a great art program, yeah. um, but it's a really big school and it's like a very um, heavy on the sciences. Mm -hmm. So the classes there are like what are called weed out classes, right? Everyone's okay. trying to do pre-med. <laughs> so... <laughs> the idea is that you get weeded out, which is what was kind of happening to me. <laughs> so I really loved science, but I just, it was not an ideal learning environment for me. And the art classes were more intimate and I felt like I had a good uh, camaraderie there. It just felt like a much better fit and like a much better way to explore the things I was really interested in, which was anatomy, and physiology and um, just the structure of the human body and of the animal body and those kind of the, where they overlap. Yeah, that's yeah. maybe a great segue into talking some about uh, your current practice. Um, oh, yeah. So at, it's like perfectly um, said in terms of the way that I think about your work is this kind of like middle ground between human and uh, animal anatomy. And I, I wonder if you might tell us some just about your thinking in the pieces you make or how you make them or, or what the practice looks like for you in the studio. Mm -hmm. um, so lately my practice is um, starts with, you know, knowing that I have these shows. So I, it's like, I know what my deadline is and I know, um, the space requirements. So, and you know, it's like, I know if I want to make several small heads or a larger piece. Right. Um, and I'm one of those artists that kind of explores very similar questions throughout the course of a few years. Right. Yeah. And so on a certain piece, I'll feel like I, with each piece, I try to push myself, but maybe that's a technical push or like, a, you know, doing a different way of building, or using a different kind of sculptural stand or something. So probably from the outside, the work looks really similar, but in, you know, internally, I'm like, oh, that was really a leap <laughs> for me. Um, like, uh, yeah, so what I do is start with a sketch, um, just two dimensional sketch. And then I um, have kind of this rough idea of some kind of what the surface is gonna be because I've started using, I usually use, um, I'm, look, I'm looking at the clays that I have down there, low fire earthenware, red clay. That's like what I started with in Italy and where my really, where, what I love, um, just cause it's so fleshy and like that, that's, it's very skin-like that color, that brown yeah. color. Um, but I've started doing surfaces that are fired on cause I'm thinking more about the archival quality of my work. Yeah. Um, so I started using a white stoneware with pigmented porcelain over that. Yeah. Um, and so I actually have to make that decision. Like once I have an idea of what I'm going to make, I have to make to make that decision of what kind of clay I'm going to use. Um, and then I make a bunch of little test tiles. So I can show you guys some of these. Oh. So here, this is actually, this is a brown stoneware with pigmented porcelain. Um, so some of these, you know, don't really ever come to fruition. Um, but it's important for me to kind of work through, work through any kinks that might happen. Like this most recent piece I made, which I, I wish I still had it. I delivered it a couple of days ago. I yeah, I was just looking at it. Is it a fox? <laughs> it's a I was fox. just looking at it online. Um, it's a blue fox. So these are the tests for that little guy. And I was trying to figure out some technical... Those are so wonderful. I, okay. You know, I have a, um, and I can attest to our viewers that like, this is a thing that I've seen you do over the years, not <laughs> just in clay. So I have a, a test piece from when we were at Archie Bray together and it's an eyeball with 
thread wrapped around it for the, um, yeah. you know, the socket of the eye. And I think yeah, you were yeah. testing. Ah, yes, it's very much like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, mine is a little smaller, but almost yeah. the same. And it oh, was- I'm like, so glad you have one of those. Yeah. yeah. This was the piece I made in grad school that I actually really figured out that I just love this way of working. It was like the cold surface click for me. Like you don't have to use graphite or wax or oxides to get that um, muscle articulation, right? Yeah. Or the form articulation. So I was using string. Yeah. Um, and so I do all these little tests just to make sure that, um, you know, like the glue will hold up or that the surface is not scumming or that, you know, they're going to adhere and to see what that will. And then I actually hold it up to the figure and see what that will look like translated. And so I build um, hollow with hollow slabs and I also build solid. It just depends on the figures I'm making. Like yeah. the, um, the fox that I made was built solid and then hollowed out. And that choice was because um, it was the first four-legged piece that I made that was not assembled afterwards. Uh -huh. so I had this like crazy um, support structure holding it up in the kiln. And so I had to do a test for that too, to make sure, like I had to build a miniature with a cradle and test yeah. that to make sure that um, the bigger piece wasn't just going to, you know, crack and fall apart in the kiln. Cause I had never, uh, yeah, I usually uh, attach things after they're fired yeah so do you when you so and i know that there's I actually was just on your instagram and i know that there's yeah. a picture of this that i'll i can show on the yeah i was gonna uh, offer this yeah, yeah. yeah. Do, does um that method of sort of holding things up work pretty well for you in terms of building a support structure um i guess it's like a shrink slab kind of in a way except so yeah this was a shrink slab and a cradle and that was and so I was once firing to cone six, which you know I usually just go to oh four, uh -huh. so that was a, a little bit nerve wracking <laughs> for me. Um, and it worked, it worked for me. And I usually build the supports like for the chin. Um, I'm trying to think of yeah, for chin and for antlers, I usually do that, but those have all been low fire in the past, so the clay hasn't gone through as much um movement, right, or as much stress. Yeah. And this time it, yeah, it was fine, but I do have to think, and I didn't use, I didn't do this years ago, but now that I, it's like, I don't have time to um, have a piece that doesn't work. Right. Right. Like if I had opened the kiln and that piece had a crack, it, it would have, yeah. Uh, I wouldn't have been able to show it in a show I was already committed to. Right. And so it was like all my eggs were in one basket, but I feel like that has to be okay because, um, who has time to make extra work, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Very good. And do you, uh, I guess I wonder like how that's changed over the years in terms of, um, I'm imagining other pieces uh, that I've seen of yours in the past that have um, services that perhaps could be adjusted uh after the yeah. firing you know like the cold surface treatment you have some leeway right like yes. but this, this uh -huh. new work with the colored porcelain is very much mm -hmm. finished when it comes out of the kiln so um yeah is that a decision mostly out of um a desire for the surface or out of necessity for lifestyle or what you're able to do presently or or how does how do those kind of um questions evolve in your thinking about the work yeah, so I think it's a combination of both. I was becoming more interested in surfaces that were archival. Um, oh, you said that, that's right. Yeah, and that rather than um, having a found material and then having to rely on some kind of adhesive, which I have found a really great safe adhesive, but now that my studio's in my house and I have two little kids, I'm all, you know, it's like I have air filters going. I'm always thinking about the materials that I use. Yes. And having to rely on adhesives is fine, but I don't want that to be my whole body of work. Like that was becoming to be the number one question that I was wrestling with, yeah. which yeah. every piece, with every piece. Um, and I wanted to get away from that a little bit. And I was also craving a surface that would, um, that I had a little bit more control over. So like rather than being dictated by like the way a feather is shaped, right? Which I, you know, I still use feathers cause I just am in love with them. Um, I could actually, you know, control 
the shape that I was making. Yeah, that's yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And, I would, con and control the colors a little bit more too. Right? Yeah, I was really excited yeah. to see that pigmented uh, clay surface on the recent piece. Like, oh, I, I, okay. I've always been so attracted to the way you use the line quality with the work that you make. I mean, the string on those eyeballs, or yeah. thinking of the um, the the matriarch sort of uh, ape mm -hmm. or. or orangutan maybe piece yeah. um the way the sticks would shape i mean there are many things like this that i've seen you do mm -hmm. over the years and like it's always like the way you utilize the line quality of the material you're working with that i find especially sort of um exciting and so to see then you have like you said full control over what those elements actually are or what they're like to me feels like a really exciting development in the work yeah oh well thank you yeah and i need you know i need to figure out some technicalities like this is <laughs> making me wish that in my undergrad i did have a little bit more of a typical ceramic experience right but it's actually really fun to be at this stage and be thinking that i do need to figure out the technicalities to be learning about that right now yeah um so how do you conceptually like decide on a fox say uh, I have a wheelhouse of a few different animals I use, uh -huh. then like pluck others here and there. Yeah. And animals always have to have some like physical simulacra with, uh, with the human body, right? And also I have to be able to sort of abstract it. So the fox is this, uh, the form of a fox. It, almost does become abstract because their bodies are hidden with all that fur. Yes. And it's sort of like this iconic image that we're used to seeing in, you know, children's books. Um, and, the, uh, you know, I, I really just have to fall in love with it. And this fox is a, um, it's a red fox, which is all, you know, all over Missouri, probably all over Iowa yeah. as well. So I have to have some kind of loose connection um, with the animals I'm making and also be able to translate the uh the body into something that becomes something more than just a fox with fur if that makes sense yeah yeah is it uh i think of foxes also archetypically as sort of like trickster animals uh, yeah and that's the whole part that i just completely slipped over gloss yeah yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> the other main thing is all the animals I do have to have some kind of in like embody some duality and they're all arch like they're mostly archetypal animals like I use apes many times um, or primates and they are um, you know they uh, embody all these human qualities right yeah. um, and I use deer a lot of the time which are like these you know kind of in between the human suburban urban world and yeah. also wildness so like in between domesticated and wild but all the animals i use also you know have to resonate with me on a formal level if right. that makes sense so um i'm really interested in beauty which sounds so cheesy to say <laughs> but uh they all you know have like i have to have this sense of longing if that makes sense yeah, um and so and the fox right is a trickster but the form of the fox is also quite beautiful yeah yeah it's always shocking when i see one because they're so reclusive and then yes. yeah. what you said about the size of the fur related to the body like the tail mm -hmm. is always much puffier than i right. am expecting it to be it's right it's all it's special when you see one Yes, and I, yeah, where we used to live in Maryland, we lived on this little, like, a, in a coastal town, and um, we would always see these foxes kind of slinking around, and it was like a magical sighting, because there is it somewhere in between a dog and a cat, yeah. and like the deer kind of live in these, like, suburban developed areas, so it does feel like this magical experience of, like, experiencing a wild animal in your domestic environment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that's very cool to hear you talk some about. I, I guess I also think like one of the things that those pieces do for me um, is that it allows me to have a gateway into sort of psychological human conditions from the distance of like the animal lens and in a way that's like more approachable maybe than a direct human representation. Is it, does that make sense with what you're thinking? Yeah, that makes, yeah, that makes total sense. Um, the way you know many of the pieces i make are avatars for mm -hmm. humans in you know that i'm close to or in my own life yeah um and having 
having that sort of psychological distance um, and yet simultaneous connection, I guess, um, if that makes sense, Absolutely. is something that's really, yeah, feels really important to me. And maybe, you know, it, oftentimes it's in the eyes where I'm seeing this connection happen. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you might uh, share some with us about, um, we talked some earlier about pieces that have inspired you and you were talking particularly about a museum in Italy that you have a catalog from. Yeah. Um, I wonder if this might be a good time to, to bring that out. Yeah. Um, so while I was in Italy, we spent a lot of time at this museum, which is called La Specola, and it's the Medici Wax Cadaver Collection. Yes. So um, the way these were made, I think, is that they injected, they actually made molds of, of dead bodies. And at the time, uh, we were going there as a drawing class to, um, to do anatomical drawings. So it's a medical museum. It's where doctors would study. Maybe they still study. Um, and something that I became just so enamored with was how incredibly beautiful the inside <laughs> of the body is right sounds like such an obvious statement but something that would kind of be seen as visceral and you can see the clay like i've used this a lot there's clay all over the pages <laughs> um something that might be otherwise sort of like visceral and off-putting um actually you know at this museum was so beautiful so here's a perfect example yeah yeah and this catalog is so nice because they lay these things out sometimes there's like necklaces on them and i know like, i actually right? been trying to find that page yeah um uh -huh. like i mean they really i think present it with a, a sort of enhanced view of the beauty yes right exactly yes and uh, the wigs and the women like are basically made up right yeah, yeah. um and so that yeah the um the victorian kind of although this isn't victorian but just that sensibility of like the macabre um, and the decoration of this kind of, um, you know, gory, gory sort of visuals, right? Yeah. Um, and just that, you know, like the beautiful presentation of it, it's our bodies, of course, it should be something that's beautiful, right? right. Um, and I also just fell in love with the fact, it like became so interested in the fact that what's on the inside, like this uh, beautiful musculature, like the way the capillaries flow all over the body could become almost like a tattoo or something yeah. on yeah. the body. So that's, you know, that's imagery I go back to again and again. And the way that I, I didn't really mention this, but once I have the, um, either the wet clay figure or the fire piece, I map it out almost like, um, in figure drawing the way you kind of shade along the musculature yep. so i try to like bring the inside to the outside surface if that makes sense and it ends up being this combination of the way fur patterns grow yes um but also kind of follows along with the musculature of the body and sometimes i bring in human anatomy into that other times um it's most times it's the anatomy of the actual animal but yeah, the, I mean, yeah, this museum is just incredible. Yeah, so, I mean, it's so it's so cool to see how these things um, like manifest in terms of your thinking, and then hear about the process and yeah. getting to see them actually show up in the work is is really great. So um, yeah, those gosh, they're haunting images, like amazingly beautiful and strange and bizarre in all the in all the right ways. Um, yeah, and I think like if I had an environment to picture. Um, my work in it would be like the back room of a museum or something yeah. in, a, in a natural history museum do you know like the yeah, um, yeah. Uh, and one of the original natural history museums not even a contemporary one so like some kind of you know I'm really interested in that idea of the specimen and whether it's like from something fantastical that didn't really exist and is just made is it a made object or is it something that really existed yeah very cool yeah um, well, maybe in closing, you want to tell us a little bit about uh, your current show that you have at Dwayne Reed? Yeah, so uh, he and I um, co-curated an exhibit that was going to be at Enseca in Richmond. It was going to be at the convention center there. And it was then traveling to his gallery, which is here in St. Louis. Um, and it has six artists. It's called Delicate Multiplex. And the artists are Bean Finnerin, uh, Zemmer Pillard. Jess Riva Cooper, myself, 
Janice Jakielski and Rain Harris. And it's, um, so all the work kind of uh, visually has this idea of the like decorated multiple and uh, revolving around, you know, depictions of nature. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that was kind of the theme. And it's on view right now on, you can see it on Artsy. I can send you a link if you want. Yeah, yeah, we can put it in the video. Um, yeah. It's wonderful to be able to find another way to show the collection too, given the sort of moment we're in. Um, and uh, yeah, that's such a stellar group of, uh, of artists. I mean, I, I know um, Jess and Janice and I mean, mm -hmm. uh, all of them at Zimmer too, like just really, really phenomenal. Um, technicians and uh you know sort of conceptual thinkers also so yeah and yeah so something yeah like the 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 tightness there's a tightness there and also um uh yeah a loose uh, yeah like this juxtaposition between tight and repetitive and also kind of loose like yeah. i um you know i don't well we talked about being finneran's work but all her work yeah and it has to be installed on site so she was yeah. going to come to the conference and like have someone hired and was just going to work for a day straight installing this like giant ring yes um a and it all relies, of clay right yes like, individual yeah. coils that are like curved you know giant um straws kind of yeah. yeah of clay and they all just rely on physics to hold each other up yeah, it's, it's a nightmare. Like incredible. <laughs> I know, I can't, right? I can't imagine. So there's this bush right now in the gallery that I'm just swooning over. Yeah, that's, um, that's and I mean, in Rain's work, it's like that too, in the sense of like this yes. accumulation of massive little parts. And yes. I feel like they're often fired, but when I look at them, I think like, mm -hmm. how on earth, like did, know. you know, they're so thin, the little petals of flowers, like. Yes, yeah, and I'm very, um, kind of old fashioned in that way. Like I love being able to have that sense of wonder about how, like of being able and, and being drawn to think about how the thing was made and not, you know, it's like, I know how it's made, but I can't imagine the skill involved. Right, yeah. Well, yeah. I don't- Kind of like a non-artist way of thinking and about and viewing work, right? You don't get the, oh, I could do that. But that's what <laughs> right? we want, right? Like, I think like, I, 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 I never get tired of being amazed by something. Right. Uh, um, and so, and I guess the threshold gets, uh, I don't know, pushed longer the further, like the more people's mm -hmm. techniques improve or the longer I look at things maybe. Right. Mm -hmm. um, in a sense, we get numb to it, I think. But um, yeah. I mean, every single one of those people in that show does things that I see and I'm like, how, you know, how did this happen? Uh, right, right. <laughs> and also the frailty and like fragility of it, right? I think is really, um, something that was uh, very special to me and would have been exciting to have in the convention center, but also would have given me heart palpitations. But. <laughs> <laughs> safer, safer <laughs> there in St. Louis. Right, safer viewed online, yes. Well, very good. Um, Lindsay, it's really wonderful to talk with you. And uh, You too, thank yeah. you so much. Well, thank you for taking time to do this today and oh, uh, yeah. for sharing all of these things with us. Um, what's the best way for people to find your work uh, online right now? Um, probably my website. And yeah. then I also am represented by Dwayne Reed Gallery. So, so both of those. Yeah. Okay. We'll post those links here also thank for you. people. So, okay. Thanks so much, Lindsay. Thanks, Andy. Take care. Yeah, you too.